Good morning, um, and a very warm welcome to everyone to the sixth meeting of the Devolution Further Powers Committee here in the Scottish Parliament. I'm delighted to welcome such a, an esteemed panel this morning, but first of all, I need to deal with apologies. I think we've got an apology from Stuart Maxwell and Bill Kidd is his sub substitute today. I know Tavish is coming, but he's running just a little bit behind schedule. So thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, we have a good panel of witnesses. Um, professors, I'm not going to read out all your titles, professors, but I will mention my name. Um, David Bell, David Heald, Charlie Jeffrey, Michael Keating and Nicola McEwen. Uh, thank you for coming along today to help us in the deliberations around the Smith Commission proposals. Um, I'm going to try and run this a bit more like a, a round table, even though it's not set up in that way, to try to get the conversation flowing. But that means a bit of discipline in us all. Members, in the way they ask questions, obviously tight. Um, Panellists, to be as concise as they can. I'll try to pull it back if I feel it's going off in a direction that's not where, where we should be. General questions to begin with, then we'll move into tax welfare and probably some of the constitutional stuff around that. Um, so when a member asks you a question, just accept that as a question to you all. I don't expect you all need, you don't all need to answer, of course, if you feel you don't need to. But if you want to contribute, please do. With that being said, can I just kick the proceedings off with um, just asking you to what extent, uh, as a, a, a group of panel members, you consider that the Smith Commission proposals and the recommendations represent a coherent package um, of powers for the Scottish Parliament? Uh, how implementable are they? And what challenges um, might we expect? And that's a very broad question, but it allows us to get started and I'm sure allow others to put in supplementaries. So we'd like to kick off. Go on, you go, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think they amount to a The fundamental problem is the circumstances in which the Smith Commission was set up and the timetable that it was given. And this has not allowed the kind of material consideration, public debate, civil society input or research that will be required to put together a coherent set of proposals. And we know the political circumstances in which the vow was made and the timetable uh, was set, but it doesn't make for good policy making. And on the taxation side, uh, it would have been better to think about the range of taxes that might be appropriate for the Scottish Parliament. There was an unfortunate fixation uh, on income tax, and so practically all the extra tax powers are loaded onto a single tax, uh, which itself has uh, various problems, which I'm sure my colleagues can explain, uh, rather than having a broad range of taxes, which in devolved and federal systems would be more normal. Uh, and then on the welfare side, instead of thinking about what kind of welfare settlement might be appropriate for Scotland and what kind of powers might be devolved in order to create a more coherent welfare system, the approach was to block off pretty much all of universal credit, which doesn't leave very much over, uh, and then just see what can be done uh, at the edges. Uh, and finally, the approach, and this maybe stems from the way that it was negotiated amongst political parties, has not been to look at broad policy areas and think about what Scotland might do, but to take existing policies and existing programs and do all little bits of them. So we have here and there in the report things like the extraction of ability to change the so-called bedroom tax, because that's a sore point, or the ability to legislate for gender equality in public policies, which are a very, very small slice of a bigger policy area, which is to do with uh, equalities legislation. And I think it would have been better to have taken a little more time to have taken this through the next general election to allow people like us to do more number crunching and simulation on the taxation uh, and to get a bigger public input and a real public engagement because I think the public don't understand really what is in Smith because they were not part of the process as the Commission was putting together its proposals. Thank you, Michael. Charlie, you want to come? Yes, I will. I, I'll, I'll not uh, cover the same ground as Michael, um, though I, I pretty much agree with it. Uh, I wanted to, to go on to the implementability uh, question um, and connect that to legislative process. Um, clearly, the, uh, the, the Smith Commission proposals are set to be transformed into a draft bill. 
uh, in January, which will then have at least some introduction into the House of Commons before the UK election. The UK election will intervene. The Commons will continue. The Lords will have a say. Uh, and ultimately, this Parliament will need, um, on the precedent of the 2012 Scotland Act, to give its uh, consent. Um, the challenges in that uh, arise uh, from the opportunities that that legislative process in two parliaments gives to question the content of the Smith Commission proposals. Uh, we have seen voices uh, from within the parties which signed up to the agreement which have criticised it from various uh, directions. Um, there will be opportunity for those criticisms to be voiced uh, and perhaps to gain traction. Um, and then there's a, a second dimension which um, it was rumoured we would hear more about today in the form of a, a, a publication by the UK government of a command paper on uh, institutional reform in England. But it's quite clear that a number of, uh, of MPs, primar primarily in the Conservative Party, to some extent in the Labour Party, uh, are seeking to recreate the linkage between progress on uh, the Smith uh, Commission proposals uh, with reform uh, in England, which David Cameron initially set out on the 19th of September and then moved back from. Uh, I think we will see uh, attempts to, to re-establish that linkage, which of course then complicates matters by connecting Scottish reform with English reform, which itself is hardly a matter of consensus in England. So plenty of challenges is the summary. Okay. Anybody else want to come at this stage? Or are you all? Uh, just briefly, um, I, mean, I, I agree with a lot of what my colleagues have said already, um, one of the concerns that I have building on what Michael was saying is that I think we're moving away from a reserve powers model which was one of the strengths of the original devolution settlement. Um, this increases the powers of the Parliament but at the same time makes the Parliament more dependent in a way um, because of the direct interdependencies in tax policy and welfare policy um, and that will create some uh, challenges uh, for managing that interdependence, perhaps some new anomalies uh, as well and some constraints on what the policy options could be. So I think there are lots of challenges. I think it is implementable um, and in the implementation process we will start to get some more substance on what uh, the, pro the proposals actually mean um, and that, that could maybe cha change things along the way as well but I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, because I think it will, politics might dictate the process of change anyway, um, but I think that there will be new anomalies that emerge that increase pressure to come back to this again and maybe try and get something that's a bit more coherent. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm more sympathetic than Michael is, is for, for the concentration on income tax, which I've been arguing for uh, devolving income tax for a long time. But I've been very worried through the referendum campaign on the Smith Commission coverage uh, that people seem to think that more powers means more spend. It actually means a lot more risks, and the question of how those risks are managed is crucially important. I think the other point, the other point is that if you've got the, the percentage of the Scottish Parliament spend that is actually covered by money notionally under the control of the Scottish Parliament has to be unpacked. Um, Gordon Brown referred to 54%. People now seem to be using a number of 60%. But if you've got no policy control over those, tax, over those taxes, uh, it, it isn't in any sense genuine accountability. So fiscal accountability has to operate at the margin and the tax powers have to be, have to be usable. And when the tartan tax came in, I warned, I warned of the danger that the power might atrophy from non-use, and that's exactly what it did. Um, the problem about not the problem about non-use is one one carries the, all the administrative all the administrative costs without actually having any of the any, any of the, any of the policy control. And one of the things I, I would fear is that political parties will go into the in 2016 election promising either to reduce the Scottish tax rates or to keep not to put them above the rate, rate, rate in, in, in the rest of the United Kingdom. And one saw in the autumn statement the disruptive potential of what the UK government does. This parliament spent a long time trying to reform property taxes, stamp duty land tax uh, and produce new tax. 
implementable at the beginning of April. What the UK government then did is actually basically disrupt that implementation by suddenly changing, suddenly changing the, the, UK, the rest of the UK tax. So the question of the interaction between the two parliaments is crucially important. And I, I think the package can be made, to, the Smith package can be made to work, but once you have to think very carefully about what the institutional arrangements are. Um, a long time ago, I proposed the Territorial Exchequer Board. I think we've got to come to the point that we, we, require, we require some institution with the capacity to access Treasury data that will actually make sure that all the relevant information gets put in the public domain uh, immediately and not, uh, not with long lags. Do you want to come at this stage? <coughs> Just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, I won't add to what, what my <coughs> colleagues have said, but it, it is crucial in, in all of this to consider how the block grant will be adjusted in relation to uh, the new powers that, uh, that, are, uh, that may be coming uh, to uh, Scotland and uh, the uh, distinction between annually managed expenditure and departmental expenditure limits is going to be very important in respect of that. Uh, and I agree very much with David that there is a need to make this much more, trans these, the way that the whole system works, uh, much more transparent because we're still going to be, um, I think, relatively exposed to decisions made at Treasury level about how the formula it works in practice, uh, which you know stand to make quite a bit of difference. In, in my paper, uh, you know, uh, and David understandably drew attention to uh, how stamp duty has changed. There's also uh, arguably some some gaming going on in relation to air passenger duty uh, and corporation tax. Uh, but in fact, the most crucial. Uh, decision made by, as far as Scotland is concerned, in the autumn statement made by the Chancellor was the continuation of the uh, um, uh, ring fencing of health and education spending in Scotland. And if that had not been ring fenced and, and, and cuts were spread across uh, the entirety of departmental budgets at the UK level, the Scottish budget would be £2.5 billion less than it than it uh, is, is currently going to be. These last couple of areas, one supplementary for me, because it, it, it takes us into some of the areas it's explored in the, the papers. The transparency of the block mechanism, the Barnett formula, and, uh, and I think David mentioned in his paper the potential for gaming, and you used that same description, David. Um, I wonder, could, could, you, could you expand on that a bit more? Because... Obviously, if you're sitting here in the Scottish Parliament and we've got to, in future, set our tax rates, agree our policies, but there's potential for disruption elsewhere in the way it's been described, that could be pretty significant. So I, need, I think we need to understand it a bit more, but also what mechanisms we need to put in place to begin to, to deal with that. And I think you began to touch on some of that, David. Can we just explore that a wee bit more? I've made a good academic living out of the Barnett formula for a very long time. Um, the, the, the reason I've been able to make a good academic living is that the proper information isn't put in the public domain at the right time. So, for, exa for, so for, for example, how the block mechanism works, how things are determined to be comparability, uh, I'm sure members have heard about the arguments about whether the Olympics, uh, whether the regeneration of East, East London connected with the Olympics was Barnet was Barnet was, Bar was Barnet rel rel relevant. Uh, there's a recent paper from the Institute of Fiscal Studies arguing that Scotland is currently a billion pound overfunded because of a, a complicated issue about how, how, how business rates in England are, are treated within, within the programme for communities and local government. And that has effects which um, are said to benefit Northern Ireland and, and, and Scotland and damage, and damage Wales. And I think one of the, one of the worrying things about Barnet is, is, is that because the Labour government didn't actually maintain the system uh, during the period of plenty of money around in the 2000s, uh, Scot Scotland to some extent has lost Wales. And the complaints of Wales are increasingly used by London against Scotland uh, and to some extent against, against Northern Ireland. Uh, so that without the numbers in the public domain presented in an, in a, in an annual paper to all the parliaments and assemblies in the United Kingdom, there will always be arguments about, about whether there have been political fixes that are to the advantage of some or, or the disadvantage of others. And I don't think 
I mean, the, the, po the, point, the point I made to the Finance Committee recently is I don't think the Finance Secretary in Scotland can actually propose an increase in the Scottish income tax rate above the rest of the United Kingdom in interest, uh, um, income tax rate unless one is sure there will not be punishment through some adjustments on the block grant. And similarly, the reason why when this Parliament had too much money in the 2000s uh, because of Barnet consequences coming from English health and education, and it was all piling up in end year flexibility at risk of being taken away by the Treasury. The reason why uh, the, the Parliament couldn't use the tartan tax in the downwards direction is that people feared that, people feared that the Treasury would actually come and punish uh, the Parliament by amending the block grant. So you can already have serious tax varying powers at an evolved level if there's confidence there are not secret repercussions in terms of your, grant, of your grant settlement. So I think the Smith Commission proposals can be made to work, but they can only be made to work. As Michael earlier said, there now needs to be proper technical discussion of the detail, but they can only be made to work if there's proper transparency about how the system operates. Okay. Um, I know Mark's got a supplementary in that area, uh, which will, uh, is specifically in the Barnett stuff, is it? It, it? it touches on what David Bell was talking about in terms of adjustments, okay. um, and, it, and it relates to the present experience around uh, the land and building transaction tax. Now, at the moment, um, as you say, the, the Cabinet Secretary outlined his proposals for the rates for LBTT. Um, at the time, he said he didn't know at that stage for sure that they would prove to be revenue neutral because the block grant adjustments had not yet been made clear. I understand that to date, with you know, only a couple of months to go until the budget has to be set, that remains unclear. And so the concern would be that that kind of approach on simply on LBTT, if that plays out for other devolved taxes, we might find ourselves in a very troubling position when it comes to trying to set rates or being put in the position of setting rates before we know what the adjustments are likely to be, finding out later the adjustments are not what we anticipated they would be, and having to make a recalculation and a readjustment and all of the knock-on consequences that could have for wider Scotland. So I'd be interested in your views on that and how we overcome that. So, David, you want to go on this one? Yeah, I just going to, I mean, so um, inevitably, if you, if you take on tax powers, you will take on uh, new risks and new opportunities. That's clear. How these are kind of mediated really comes through how the block grant is adjusted. So you can kind of share some of the risks by adjusting the formula in, in one way or another. For example, you could adjust the block grant in relation to changes in population, and that takes out the population risk. So how this is done is, is tremendously important and really nerdy, I'm afraid, but, but, but it is extremely important. And that's why it's, it, it is absolutely, um, I think, essential to have the rules uh, agreed in advance, way in advance of, of, uh, of you know, the current situation, uh, and also transparently, as, as David has said, so that everyone knows where they stand. Now, that being the case, you know, it, it is still quite possible to have, ta in relation, for example, to income tax, to have tax competition on the same tax base. So the, the UK government is taxing the incomes of uh, people in Scotland and in the rest of the UK, and Scotland is also taxing the, that same tax base. And th there's quite a, a literature on this issue because the same thing happens in the US where you have state and federal income taxes, or you don't have it in all states, but in most states. Um, and the question then is, do people end up getting overtaxed? and depends what kind of decision uh, is being made and, and David is taking the view that it won't be possible for the Scottish Government to increase the, uh, the uh, headline tax rates over um, uh, the UK rates. It might be possible to play around with the, uh, with the bans because that may be seen to be uh, less headline grabbing. but. Um, uh, I think we do have to be aware of this possibility as well that, that uh, you can end up with a situation where the people are, because they're being taxed on the, same, on, on the same tax base twice, that it's possible you end up being overtaxed. 
could, could I just clarify, I didn't say you couldn't use, alter the headline rights. I said you couldn't use the headline rights unless you had certainty about what the grant repercussions were. That, that's, yeah. essentially, that's essentially my point. But responding, responding to the question, um, I think there are two issues. One of them is there are big technical issues about calculating the, the block grant deduction when you get a tax. That's particularly the case where you have a transactions tax, like the property tax. I don't, personally, I don't like transactions taxes. It would be better if it was an annual tax, but I understand the political difficulty of that. So there's a, there's a serious <coughs> technical issue which you, one should do openly, and you need to do it sufficiently ahead of decision. The decision about how, it's done, how, how the deduction will be calculated needs to be done sufficiently ahead of the, the political decision on what the, rate, what the rates are. But the, but, the, but the other issue is a concern that the UK government could cut income tax rates and put up national insurance rates. So the kind of substitutability, the substitutability of taxes by the, by the UK government could put pressure on Scotland and on Wales, Wales if Wales, get, Wales, Wales, gets a, Wales gets an income tax. And the important point was that this Parliament at least tried to do the change in, uh, in property transaction tax in a revenue neutral way. What the UK government did in the autumn statement wasn't revenue neutral. There was a substantial budget cost paid for by, paid for by other taxes. And that's obviously, when you've got a narrow portfolio of taxes, that's obviously a risk for the devolved Parliament. Listen, we've, we've gone into the area of taxation and Barnett very quickly, quicker than expected, but it was my fault for doing that. But I'll let Lewis come in and I've got Stuart McMillan who wants to ask questions as well. Well, I have a general question, but it does relate substantially to tax because the issue of implementation has been uh, touched on already. And uh, there's a report this morning from the Auditor General on the implementation of the 2012 Act. Now, clearly, uh, time is not the key constraint here, at least if, if it is. Um, then it would be quite surprising because this has been two years in the implementation. The conclusion of the Auditor General is that the Scottish Government has done what it needs to do in terms of the legislative framework, which is one of the things we've talked about, but that the actual provision of the, the people and, and the IT systems and so on for this one relatively small uh, uh, or two relatively small tax items uh, is not yet in place and that that might have consequences. I wonder if we can draw any lessons from that and generally from the implementation of the 2012 Act thus far um, for the prospect of implementation of, 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 of the next Scotland Act. I don't think implementation of taxes is ever going to be easy. Uh, I mean, one only has to look at the record of HMRC to see, to, to see that. Um, but the crucial point about the Smith Commission proposals is that, is that the implementation rests with, rests with HMRC. Uh, once not, Revenue Scotland isn't going to have a direct uh, implementation role in, in, in uh, the Smith Commission, Smith Commission income tax. But the crucial point is that for the first time in the UK, the question of whether one's a Scottish resident is actually going to be important. And one number which I think people should bear in mind is that, that presently, or the latest data that HMRC have published, is that 42,000 Scottish income tax payers pay 22% of Scottish income tax revenues. And that means that the effort that HMRC put into implementation is actually going to be, going to be, going to be very important. And one can, just in the same way as the big accountancy firms have solved corporation tax avoidance uh, schemes, one can, imagine, one can imagine either that they'll be selling schemes on how to avoid either Scottish residents or to get Scottish residents, depending on what the relative tax rates are. So one need, for the credibility of the taxes, one needs, clearly needs good implementation. I just want to see if anybody else wants to comment at this stage before I come back to you, David, so I'll widen okay. this out a bit. It's okay. Just on the, uh, the issue of, of implementation, I think it's absolutely critical because we know that IT systems in these fields never work. Uh, they're always over budget, they're delayed. Governments are sold systems that are too complicated and that are invented uh, in, in order to create work for, for the providers. We, we, we know this and this is going to happen. Uh, but this is <coughs> exacerbated if you do things piecemeal. Uh, and uh, if you introduce uh, 
too much complexity into the system, what Nicola was talking about earlier on, a complicated interrelationship of UK and Scottish, whether it's taxation or, or welfare. And so that's why it's important to get the principles right firstly. Uh, and indeed, we've got, as, as you're saying, we've got the 2012 Act, and then another thing following that. We don't know what the relationship of these is going to be. So it would be much better to sort out the bases first, have a proper discussion on that, and then think about the implementation. This again is another warning against rushing things, things through too rapidly in response to political events. Charlie, you're not doing there. I would, uh, I would add to that. We've, um, David, the Davids have talked about the spillover effects um, that can uh, arise when the UK makes a tax decision, which then uh, has a significance for a tax power here. Um, my uh, another concern is has also been touched upon by the others, and I wanted to put it in a slightly different way, uh, and that is that the uh, the the balance of reduction of the block and the financial possibilities of new tax powers uh, has to bear in mind the relationship of incentive and risk, uh, and the incentive has to be there for the, the Scottish Parliament decision maker. Um, to make a decision, and if that decision produces more revenues per capita uh, than is the case uh, elsewhere in the UK, then the Scottish Parliament should benefit from that, and there shouldn't be uh, a consequent penalty through changes in, in the block element. Equally, uh, and of course this is much less likely, um, the Scottish Parliament could make bad decisions with its, uh, with its tax powers and end up with fewer tax revenues per head, uh, than, than elsewhere in the UK, and it should bear that risk. Now, I think getting those uh, balances right, uh, and uh, alongside uh, other provisions which might uh, produce uh, compensation effects for, for asymmetric shocks, which are not the fault of the Scottish Parliament decision maker, uh, is going to be absolutely crucial. Uh, and I do think that's a question of principle which needs to be addressed uh, before you get into, into the, to the nerdy stuff that uh, David has been uh, uh, talking about, which is really, really important, but it's only important once you have uh, a clear sense of principle at the outset. The man come back in in that case at this stage. <laughs> Well, no, uh, just to say, I think on the income tax thing, as David says, the, the, the key issue for HMRC has been this um, decision about uh, whether individuals are Scottish taxpayers or rest of UK taxpayers. That work has largely been done. I think the marginal cost then of uh, um, allowing variation in rates uh, uh, and uh, in bans is probably not going to be uh, quite as uh, quite as uh, uh, as difficult for them to uh, to achieve. Um, interestingly, one of the things that hasn't been spoken about very much is the cost to businesses of this the, uh, the the change in the income tax system. Because I guess one of the things that <coughs> may be limited the changes to uh, rates and bans was the possibility of, of, of having a substantial or allowing the Scottish Parliament substantial powers to define the, the a taxable income and that would have I think uh, meant much more significant costs to, uh, to uh, the business sector in particular if the PAYE system somehow co uh, uh, was compromised. Lewis, I think, had a supplementary. Simply, uh, simply a quick supplementary. In terms of the implementation of the 2012 Act and the criticisms that have been raised, clearly uh, uh, colleagues will not have the opportunity to read the detail of the criticism. But is the, does, it, uh, does it suggest that there is a, a risk of underestimating the institutional uh, task of implementing changes, that, particularly those that involve the introduction of new, tax, new taxes and new tax powers? Actually, that's something that would be quite useful to understand where the risk li most li lies most. Does it lie most in the UK, or is, uh, where we might require a lot of changes, is the biggest risk lie here? That's actually quite an interesting. I mean, the, the, there's obviously a lot of reputational risk for the Scottish Parliament if the, if the tax powers, if devolved tax powers, don't get implemented effectively. Um, but a bit of, obviously, obviously, these things are difficult. These things are difficult because the, system, the tax and benefit system are complex. Our IT systems have to cope with millions of millions of tra millions of people uh, people and transactions, and one's only got to look at the difficulties with universal credit uh, 
to see that the, this is an area, a very, very high risk area that one has to think about, think about very carefully. And, and clearly, that means you have to put sufficient resources into these things and give it sufficient amount of time. Over optimistic timescales are uh, driven by, say, election cycles, are obviously risky. Nicola? Just on, on the, <coughs> the delivery arrangements, the, the, the Smith report leaves open. Um, to the Parliament to determine around those areas of devolved social security whether a similar exercise in establishing a Scottish bureaucracy um, be gone through here or whether delivery partnerships uh, be put in place with DWP. So, I mean, I, I haven't read the report from this morning. I think from the reports on the radio it was a bit mostly about Revenue Scotland and um, clearly there would be lessons there to be learned, but there's always going to be trade-offs with these things. So one of the advantages um, of setting up a separate bureaucracy would be that it would give greater scope to deliver things in a way that most matched policy intentions or policy design. Um, of course, that would come with some costs in terms of maybe waiting on implementation to get it right, uh, financial costs uh, for setting up and running that kind of bureaucracy. Um, but you know, some issues around that is where, where, do the, where does the trade-off best lie and to what extent do you think that this might be investing for the future? Is it likely that further social security powers would be devolved at some point in the future, in which case um, you know, the, the investment might be worthwhile? Okay, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, I mean, this morning, uh, we've heard some, uh, some interesting uh, contributions and certainly some, uh, some interesting words in, in terms of uh, lack of transparency, gaming, punishment, and uh, secret repercussions, uh, to name just, uh, just a few, uh, as well as uh, lack of cohesion. Um, and so in terms of the, what Smith has proposed, um, does uh, do the panellists think that, uh, that Smith's proposals uh, actually are workable, uh, particularly regarding the financial elements, uh, and also is the, is the constitutional architecture there uh, between uh, Scotland and uh, the UK government to ensure that, actually, that the financial uh, arrangements actually take place? I think the answer to that is uh, not yet, no. Um, um, Smith, uh, page 15, I've got it in front of me. Uh, needs to, uh, there is a need to lay out the details of new bilateral governance arrangements which will be required to oversee the implementation and operation of the tax and welfare powers to be devolved by the way of this agreement. Uh, they are not there um, and uh, they need to be there and I think we've heard from uh, the panellists some of the, the features of the machinery which would be needed uh, including uh, regularity, uh, transparency, um, and uh, a clear set of principles which would underlie the operation uh, of such arrangements. But those arrangements are clearly not yet in place. Sorry, can I just comment that, I mean, I think that there's a distinction to be made between constitutional arrangements and then intergovernmental machinery, intergovernmental arrangements. And there, there is the Joint Exchequer Committee, which is completely lacking in transparency, but, you know, it's something to perhaps build upon. My understanding of that is that it's been focused on implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, but what I think would be needed is something more like a standing arrangement to oversee um, not just the operation of those areas that are devolved, but their relationship with what's not devolved and what's not reserved, because there would be that constant um, mutual dependence in a way. So. Uh, in the Smith report there, there are a lot of good intentions and good words about cooperation and so on but unless that's underpinned by institutions <clears throat> then it doesn't necessarily uh, amount to very much. Uh, what's been lacking in this debate is any appreciation of what happens in federal systems. There's been a lot of loose talk about federalism and federalism as the answer but the point about federal systems is that both levels have guaranteed powers, guaranteed um, institutional capabilities which then allow them to cooperate otherwise it just becomes a, a one-way traffic it just becomes the Treasury laying down the law and the Scottish uh, Parliament having to accept those rules we, we don't have that federal spirit here uh, at all in the United Kingdom I think it has to develop 
And the other thing is that it's very difficult to talk about this as a bilateral UK-Scottish arrangement when other parts of the UK are putting forward demands themselves and they will have to be part of the process. Now maybe they won't have exactly the same uh, arrangements uh, but it's be very difficult to imagine a system in which there's one set of arrangements for Scotland and a completely different set of arrangements for Wales and a completely different set of arrangements for, the United, for, 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 uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, responding to different principles and different ideas. So this shows us once again, having, having settled the independence issue at the referendum, we've got to think about the United Kingdom as a whole, because if it's just Scotland there dealing with the Treasury, we'll, we'll lose. Uh, but, but, but if you have devolved administrations around the United Kingdom, we can develop some kind of federal spirit in which there's a greater equality in these relationships. Uh, I'm uh, therefore, that uh, in terms of the kind of overall kind of tax policy, um, then there is a, a, a lack of uh, coherence uh, with that and, and uh, also a lack of uh, poten potentially a lack of uh, respect because there is a lack of understanding uh, of, uh, of the, kind of the federal-type uh, operations that you are suggesting. Yeah, I, I, th I think it is all of those things. Uh, now, the answer to that is, is, is not new clever institutional arrangements. The answer to that will come from the political domain. Uh, but, but the institutions have got to be right. Uh, and at the moment, it seems to me, going back to what uh, David Heald was saying, and what both Davids were saying, there's a lack of transparency in these arrangements. There's not even uh, the kind of institution you'd have in a federal system that says, well, here are the figures. Uh, we are verify these are figures are accurate. Uh, we, we know that both sides have the same amount of information. If you've got an asymmetry of information, that then you don't have the federal spirit. And most federal systems have developed mechanisms in which these, these things can be put out into the open. At least we know what the figures are. In, in Spain, which is like the UK, halfway to a federal system, this is one of the biggest problems, simply the lack of, uh, of, of information from both sides as to what the other side is, is doing. May, may I add a, a, a comment to Michael's? Um, it, it would be utterly characteristic of this state for different arrangements to be produced for different parts of it, um, each with their own impenetrable, incomple uh, impenetrable complexities. Um, that would be the, the, the natural modus operandi. Um, and I think there's a challenge uh, on this parliament uh, and this, this committee in preparing the parliament's thinking on, on the, the Smith Commission powers. Uh, and that is uh, to situate Scotland's debate within the wider UK and not see it as something self-contained within Scotland. Uh, there are very, very clear linkages across debates. Um, the Welsh debate about uh, fair funding is essentially a debate about what many see as unfair funding for, for Scotland. Uh, and the, the, the drive, which is becoming significant in English public opinion for some kind of institutional recognition of England has an awful lot to do with perceptions uh, about Scotland. Uh, and if, if we are to come to something like the, the set of uh, UK-wide, transparent, regular uh, uh, arrangements, then those debates need to be con connected and reconciled as one uh, single set of things and not uh, issues dealt with bilaterally through uh, um, bespoke arrangements for each bilateral relationship. People now who have suggested they want to ask a question, but Rob Gibson, I think, was the first person who caught my eye. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Uh, you know, the matters related in the Smith Commission to external affairs are very sketchy indeed. But uh, Michael Keating has just mentioned Spain being on a trajectory somewhat similar to Britain at the moment in terms of the relationship with the sub-state uh, governments. Um, I wonder if we could look to some better practice in other places to find the methods that have worked, for example, in terms of the shared uh, transparency in an exchequer board, for example. Uh, ideas of the kinds of taxes which uh, other uh, sub-states and other quasi-federations and federations are able to uh, call upon in order to fund their interests. Well, on, on the with tax side, uh, many places have the ability to tax corporations, US states, Canadian provinces have 
uh, corporation tax powers, they tend to converge because of competition, but nevertheless they do have the power. And sometimes what is more important than changing the headline rate of corporation tax is, is the detail, the allowances for research and development or, or whatever, the way you can actually use that tax in detail. Uh, excise taxes uh, are widely devolved. Vehicle duty can't be devolved under European rules. Capital gains taxes, inheritance tax, inheritance taxes is, is widely devolved because uh, it's on generally on fixed property, which is easy to locate. Uh, road tax is devolved, even in France, the most centralized of countries, road tax is devolved. Um, there are possibilities in land taxation, uh, and here the review of local taxation is going to be re re very important because that would give the opportunity to give local authorities more taxing powers, and, and then the Scottish Parliament would, would be able to tax less because uh, you'd have local responsibility there. Uh, and as far as... Uh, Exchequer boards and so are, are concerned. I think David Heald knows uh, a lot more about this than, than I do. Uh, but in, in Australia, in Canada, and in Germany, certainly there's a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of transparency in Spain or France or Italy, but in those other cases, uh, there are arrangements whereby you can actually see what's going on and you can get some kind of common database that both sides can share. Well, just to, I mean, so there are tax equalization uh, mechanisms in, in different, con uh, in different uh, states. And uh, it is important at the outset to kind of think about what kinds of differences in taxable capacity a state is prepared to contemplate. So you get wide vari massive variations, say, across Switzerland between uh, different uh, cantons. And, and so part of uh, uh, the debate, I think, has to be around what kinds of differences in taxable capacity and in spending capacity are, de if, you, if you go to what Charlie was talking about in relation to a wider debate within the UK as a whole, what kind mm -hmm. of differences uh, are, are acceptable within a, a, a federal state? <coughs> Listen, I'm going to do another 10, 15 minutes in this area. I think we'll need to move on to the sort of general welfare stuff. But Linda, you said you've got a very small stuff. Yeah, a very tiny, tiny question. That and I then I'm going to Bill Kidd. Yeah, I was interested in what Charlie was saying about the requirement, well, generally for more transparency, but also the requirement that Scotland doesn't act in isolation here. Um, it, it strikes me that, that uh, the UK as an entity has always been very slow to embrace change. And I wondered if you, if you felt that the willingness would be there at the nation state level down in Westminster to fully embrace the kind of changes that the panel are suggesting would be required to make all the component parts of the UK work with a degree of autonomy um, and transparency that would be necessary for success. That was a small supplementary, was it? Yeah. <laughs> it, they just need to say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Um, there is a proviso um, because um, to the extent now that the institutional recognition of England in the UK's political system is being actively considered, uh, and there's a lot of um, partisan tactic uh, in that, um, but it may well happen in some form or other, then that would give the, the UK level authorities, parliament and government, uh, a heightened rationale for distinguishing UK-wide business that it transacts from English business that it transacts. And once England becomes to be considered uh, as, a, as a distinct political unit, then you can have uh, that consideration of the different component parts of the UK in a more systematic way than now. But it probably does require England to be disentangled from the UK in terms of the UK Parliament and the UK Government. Okay. Um, Bill Kidd and then come to Drew Smith. Okay. Um, thank you, convener. Thank you, panel. In terms of um, what we've been discussing this morning, which has actually been extremely um, uh, beneficial for me to sort of try and set my head around where we stand following the referendum and the, and the Smith Commission's um, uh, deliberations. Um, I'm trying to see 
as I think a lot of people in Scotland will be, whereabouts we actually stand in terms of anything moving forward um, within a timescale, which is uh, the type of timescale that was promised at the time of the referendum or just thereafter. And, um, and Professor Jeffrey has, in his submission, uh, talked about the draft bill expected to be introduced uh, by the end of January. Then there would have to be substantive debate in the UK Parliament, but that would not be finished by the time we came to the UK elections next May. Um, and then there would have to be full scrutiny in the Scottish Parliament. And where, can I ask, um, you know, this seems to be pushing things not into long grass, but into the jungle, you know. Um, <laughs> and I'm just wondering about the potential, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, about um, where, there are, where there is agreement by all, such as votes for 16 and 17 year olds, um, would a section 30 be able to bring that around, bring that forward um, from, uh, from the general uh, debate that we've had over taxation, bring that forward so that it would be in place much sooner? And if so, if that is the case, can you envision any other powers that could be devolved through Section 30 um, and uh, see what we can actually try and achieve within a, a timescale that most of the people who voted one way or the other in the referendum could actually imagine was a real change taking place? At all. Anyone? <laughs> so. Start off, but I'm, I'm not going to finish off. I'm going to leave that to some other. <laughs> um, I noticed that in, in David Bell's um, uh, very artful submission to this committee, he talked about the, uh, the Scotland Act 2015. Uh, I think that's an, amb an ambitious timescale uh, for, for that process, which I outlined in my paper, to have been gone through. Uh, there, there is no commitment. Uh, I think Gordon Brown envisaged this when he first set out the, the timetable. Um, uh, there is no commitment on the UK government to have a second reading uh, of, of the draft bill before the UK election. Um, so that may not happen before then. Um, and so I think 2015 in those circumstances would be extremely tight. Um, and if you get into 2016, then you've got a, an election here, which could complicate matters uh, as well. Um, so in those respects, it may well be sensible on some matters to look for uh, opportunities to accelerate um, uh, the, the, the devolution of powers where there is um, clear agreement among the signatories to the Smith Commission report. And I suspect 16 to 17 year olds voting is one that uh, could be put into that category. Uh, there may well be others. Can I ask a straightforward question, Charlie and others. Yeah. Can this bit of legislation, because we heard last week and it, and from the Secretary of State and that he thought this could all be done by early um, 2016. In your view, can the legislation be in place by the time we get to the next Scottish Parliament elections? Because that will be quite an important moment. It can. Unless the, yeah, I mean, if, unless there is active interventions of one or more players to prevent that from happening. I think it can, it can be. And I think there is a... A there would have to be a political motivation to make sure that there is something in place before 2016. Um, but I think you know, spring 2016 is probably realistic. And that's just for legislation, of course. Implementation is a much longer process. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. And thanks very much. Um, one potential um, a, a area could be the Crown Estate. Uh, does anyone believe that that is possible, that could actually take place within that time scale under this proposal? I'm not, I'm not, sure. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I'd need to sort of consult on that to see if that would, be, it would require a primary legislation or not. Uh, Drew Smith. Hey, thanks very much, um, it was Just to go back, to, we've had quite an, an interesting um, discussion today and I'm reminded of the... Um, expression that you know the British Constitution uh, maybe doesn't always work that well in theory but it, it, it has served us reasonably well in practice um, and I suppose I mean, well, well, the, the point I'm actually about to come on to is, is actually the, 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 the fact that our constitutional states in Scotland it's a contested issue um, and, and I think we hear that from the reactions of fellow members of the committee and, and that um, puts us in quite a, 
a different situation from some of the relationships that you describe elsewhere in the world. Um, and why I would you know, perhaps agree with a lot of what's been said around the need for institutions which um, can balance and can be seen as fair arbiters uh, 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 in a process, whether it's about taxation or whether it's about policy or, or, or whatever. I just, there are really two points I wanted to, to put to the panel and get their actions, because I think this would be interesting to know from either elsewhere or just from your own expertise uh, what, what we can learn in a situation. Because I suppose the example, Mike, uh, Professor Keating uh, said earlier that um, the, the issue of independence had been settled in September. Um, it was a very brave thing for him to say in the Scottish Parliament because if I said that in the chamber, um, it provokes a reaction. Um, and I, I think it goes to—it it, it is frankly the elephant in the room o on this whole issue. You know, we can we can debate the workability um, of devolution uh, in our specific proposals. Of, of course, we can. But there seems to be there are, there are two distinct issues. One is the constitution itself is politically um, contested. Um, and so a resolution to some, to some of this through institutional architecture, I, I just frankly feel, is, is unlikely to work. Um, and a second issue, which is, uh, for me, really around incentives, because um, the, uh, I've got no doubt that the Scottish Government would pursue a course uh, through all of this, but they wouldn't want to see Scotland disadvantaged. Um, no doubt that they're genuine in that, um, in that approach. But they have no incentive... Um, to find a constitutional relationship or architecture that works because they don't believe that there should be a UK constitutional framework. Not the only country with that problem. Uh, this is the dilemma of Canada, Spain and many other countries which are multinational countries in which there is no agreement on where sovereignty lies or on the foundations of the constitution. Now, I'm not suggesting you have to dig all the way down to the foundations to get a consensus on the basis of sovereignty because you never will. So you can put that aside, but in the meantime, talk about institutions that work. Now, when I said the issue of independence was settled, I mean it was settled for some time in the future. Otherwise, why have a referendum? Unless it, but it's not settled forever. It never will be settled. And even if Scotland did become independent, we don't really quite know what independence means and whether we'd have our own currency and so on. So there's a whole area of uncertainty around there. Uh, and there are issues there that would never agree on, so just put them aside because most of the time they don't matter. That's the pragmatism. But principle comes in because we've got to have institutions that can work in the medium term. And if we look at what's happened in Canada, they had two referendums. They've never settled the question of sovereignty for Quebec. But their institutions are actually working pretty well because between referendums they agree, well, well, we'll agree to disagree upon that, but in the meantime we've got to get institutions that can work. Uh, in Quebec, there's been a strong concentration on institution building. We may not have sovereignty, but we're going to use the powers that we've got more effectively. And at the level of Canada, uh, there's been a, gradually a greater recognition of diversity, a greater recognition of Quebec on the part of, of, of Canada. Uh, and they've done things like sorting out their fiscal equalization system, which is a huge challenge everywhere. Uh, like getting uh, agreement on uh, safeguarding the powers of the two levels and safeguarding provincial powers against uh, federal in encroachment. Uh, and the second point I'd make I is that in these cases and, and in Scotland, although there's this difference in principle about independence or not, it seems to me these are two ways of getting at the same destination because there's a broad consensus that Scotland should be self-governing in one way and there's also a broad consensus that it shouldn't be an old-fashioned nation-state because it's going to be part of the European Union. We may have currency union. There are the, uh, the six unions that Alex Hammond talked about, of which we would keep five. So although there's this difference in theory, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot more common ground uh, than you might have think, thought just looking at the referendum debate. So in this sense, it's, it's, it's the politicians who are the ones who are obsessed with theories, and we you know, academics actually very often uh, are the ones who talk about practical things you can do even when you agree, disagree on basic principles. One additional point about the Constitution working in practice, even though it's theoretically impossible uh, in the UK. Well, um, I think the Constitution is being rejected in practice by substantial numbers of people in different parts of the UK. Uh, we saw that in 45% uh, of, of Scots voting yes, in effect, to end that constitutional relationship. Not enough to win that argument, but um, suggesting that there is a, uh, 
significant challenge to the legitimacy of the institutions of the UK here in Scotland, which has now prompted this process which we're, we're currently sitting in. But it's not just Scotland. Um, in, in work that we have done on public attitudes in England, looking at constitutional uh, um, alternatives to uh, the status quo in England, we can find a maximum level of support for the status quo, no matter how we ask the question, of 25% of people in England. In other words, this constitution is under challenge, not just in Scotland, but also in other parts uh, of the UK. Uh, and I, I, I take that as a prompt to go back to my earlier point. Uh, we're thinking about changing one of the parts here, but there are other parts changing alongside it, and some recognition of the interaction of the parts uh, is necessary if we are to have a period of stability. I think there's a couple of points I'd like to make connected with that. I think one of the things that we've not discussed at all this morning is about austerity. In terms of public spending cuts, about half the, according to the IFS, about half the public spending cuts are still to come. And they will transmit themselves through the, through, through the kind of Barnet, through the, through the Barnet system. Um, the, there is a very, the, 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 the kind of fiscal consolidation is very heavily spending based and it will be, you need more than the cons fiscal consolidation if there's also going to be tax cuts at the same time. So the kind of pressure, downward pressures on spending in the next five years are going to be very ex extreme and that's going to make it very difficult for uh, the, the parliament in terms, in, in terms of its budget. The other point that um, is important is David Bell earlier mentioned about fiscal equalisation. Um, there's, there's what I find a disturbing tendency in England about English local government of actually moving away from a system of fiscal equalisation that's roughly been going for 150 years. So, the, for example, the northern cities, the northern cities of England have been very much more hit by, by the changes in English local government finance. So there's a much more of an attitude about you keep what you kill. So the kind of, whereas the UK has always had a strong commitment at local government level to fiscal equalisation and a commitment in terms of reasonably equal, equal living standards across the United Kingdom. It's a constitutional requirement in Germany. We don't have such a thing, but there's been an implicit assumption that living standards shouldn't depart uh, and public services shouldn't depart too much from different parts of the country. That raises an issue that came up earlier, which is about Scotland not being on its own. I think this is really important, but one's got to recognise that Wales and Northern Ireland are in significantly different positions than Scotland. Scotland is sufficiently close to the UK average that we don't need to worry too much about tax-based equalisation in, in terms of income tax. Wales and Northern Ireland have got income levels way below uh, the level of the UK as, an average, as average and their income tax revenues are going to be affected by the UK practice of putting up the personal allowance so much. The, putting up personal allowance has a different effect in different regions of the regions of the United Kingdom, depending on the, depending on the, uh, depending on the distribution, distribution of income in those countries. So I think there is a kind of broader issue, both about the role of the state and how far spending cuts are going to go, and also the extent to which there is a continuing commitment to, commitment to, fiscal, to fiscal equalisation. Because I don't think that you can have income tax devolution in Wales and Northern Ireland without actually addressing, the, addressing that issue. And I agree with earlier panellists who say that if Scotland's in the room on its own with the UK government, we're going to find it extremely difficult. First of all, I'm going to come to Tavish and I really need to be on to you okay? Yeah. Tavish, okay, sorry. Yeah, Perhaps, Peter, sorry for being late earlier on. Um, what role does this, should the Scottish Parliament play in improving the accountability and transparency of the new intergovernmental relationships? And it does currently. It doesn't play any role at the moment, no, does it? exactly. It doesn't do anything at the moment. Um, I mean, I, th I, I read some of the, the transcripts from last week's um, evidence sessions and there was talk about presenting minutes and, and so on uh, to the Parliament. I'm not sure that will get you very far. Um, I mean, I think if, if there was a way that could be done to have a sort of pre-GMC-type meeting with Parliament and then a post one, then you might get a little bit more insight into the nature of the discussion. And, but I can see why that would be politically quite difficult. Um, I mean, the Smith process, Smith Commission 
wasn't in any way transparent. That was just as unfortunate. And there were reasons for that. And I think similar reasons will be applied to intergovernmental arrangements as well. Um, but I, I think there is a, a real need for greater oversight of the Parliament, particularly given the greater complexities and interdependencies and intergovernmental relations will become more important um, whether or not they become more formalised. Um, so I, I, I do think there is a, an important issue here. I take a point that, uh, and strongly agree, because I made this argument that it had to be Wales, Northern Ireland and everyone in the room in the context of those arrangements. Um, but would, the, would you accept that uh, what we might choose to do in Holyrood would be different from the Welsh Assembly or different from other parliaments in relation to how they might scrutinise these arrangements? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the scrutiny arrangements are, are a matter for parliament, this parliament. Yeah. Um, I differ slightly from what others are saying. I mean, I think there is a need for, yes, stronger multilateral arrangements but also bilateral arrangements because there are uh, specific issues for the Scottish-UK relationship here as a result of this settlement. Um, so I think you need both. Michael Keating, would you be able to just give us some, any international perspective on how Parliament scrutinise these relationships in federal systems? Is there any good example you'd care to offer? No, but there are a lot of, lot of bad examples. <laughs> It, it, so it, what, it's a, what should we but, not do then? Well, it's a fundamental problem that, that intergovernmental negotiations tend to be behind closed doors. Even where you have formal arrangements, as you have in Canada, the First Minister's Conference or Spain, the sectoral conferences, the real work, of course, is not done in, in front of the media. It's done uh, somewhere else. And the more complex the arrangements get and the more you get into governmental policy making to relate to Nicola's earlier point, then the more of a problem this, this becomes. Uh, if you look at the capacity of parliaments to hold governments to account for negotiations, probably in the Nordic countries, and especially Denmark, in relation to European negotiations, you have an example that shows where it can be done. Ministers have to come explain their position. They have to, a committee that is very specialized and that knows the dossiers. They then have to report back again. Something like that could be done for intergovernmental relations here. Uh, and all these arguments about, well, you can't show what your hand away. Oh, this has got to be confidence. I mean, this is just special pleading. Uh, by, by governments who don't want to be held uh, accountable. Uh, and again, in the case of Scotland, I would add that if the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Parliament and government are going to get greater responsibilities with regard to European matters, uh, participating more fully in the Council of Ministers, once again, the accountability arrangements here, as it was at Westminster, will really have to be improved. Thank you. Thank Alison, you very much. Alison, then I'm going to move on to the welfare area. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been having a discussion on the themes of um, transparency, communication, and how it has to be better at all levels between different governments and so on. But, um, Professor Keating, in opening, you said the public don't understand what is in Smith. I think that is a, a fair point. And we're, we're at this point today because of a fantastic participative process where people really got involved in politics. And I just wondered how you think we might ensure that that wider civic voice is heard in regard to these proposals in the coming months as we in here you know scrutinize these proposals mm. what can we do to make sure that that wider civic voice isn't excluded from these discussions well, I'm hmm. really struck by the extent civic groups are still are still mobilized and they're still interested in smith and what is happening uh, beyond smith frustrated by the process but still interested in it so i think there is the capacity to do that uh, th th there are vehicles uh, to do that, and it's up to the politicians to make sure they are uh, included. Uh, we no longer have to go out and shake people up and say, you've got to be interested, because they are interested. But if they're not involved in this continuing process in, in the immediate future, then they'll go away again. They'll be disillusioned, and things will be worse than they were before. Uh, there's been talk about constitutional conventions, I'm a little bit skeptical, but it's, it's an idea worth, worth thinking about. I'm a bit skeptical because constitutional conventions tend to stick to generalities and, and they're not, not really very good at arriving at compromises. But they are a good way of setting the agenda and informing citizens about what is happening. There's talk of a UK constitutional convention in the next parliament. It would be extremely difficult given all the different views there, but it would be a way of debating this publicly. Uh, there was talk of a constitutional convention in the case of an independent Scotland, but there may be a case for something like that. Uh, short of independence, to think about a Scottish constitution. Uh, 
we don't have a constitution. We have the Scotland Act and the reformed by the other Scotland Act and more bits and pieces of legislation. We don't actually have a constitution and it might be useful to think about having a constitution for Scotland whether or not we're part of the United Kingdom. And once again, you can think of involving civic society uh, in that, thinking about what principles might underlie that, what kind of rights we might have, uh, what, what kind of, whether you want to put social entitlements into a constitution or not, how you can improve uh, accountability. All of these things might usefully be uh, discussed because they're going to be important whether or not we become independent. So this is not necessarily as divisive as the referendum. It's think something that might be useful to improve the democratic performance of our institutions in any case. One of the reasons why the mobilisation engagement was so successful in the referendum is because people had a decision to make and they wanted to be informed about it and engaged in that process. I think if you try to mobilise and engage people without giving them any opportunity to influence the outcome, then that could have the, re the reverse effect in a way. But there are a number of areas that that could be done. It, it might be about this process. It might be about the constitution. It might be about another issue. Uh, I know the concern of yours, Alison, about um, uh, uh, devolving power within Scotland. You know, that's a debate that we just haven't really had. There's lots of things said about it, but the implications of it are not really discussed at all. So, you know, there are lots of areas that are within the responsibility of this Parliament uh, that could uh, mobilise people and engage people as long as they have a, an opportunity to affect the outcome, I think. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that we hopefully we can help as a committee on that process is in January, certainly, we're considering whether or not we can have the SDUCs, the, S, you know, the churches, the SCVO here to talk to us. Um, and that may be one of the ways we can help this uh, discussion to um, improve things. So, um, I think we need to move on to welfare areas now, folks, because otherwise I've only got about 20, just over 20 minutes left. Um, and I think Alex Johnson had, had wanted to talk, and Linda Fabiani, and then Lewis. And Mark, sorry, and Mark, Mark, Mark McDonald as well. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, we heard earlier uh, the line that uh, welfare cuts will transmit themselves through Barnet. Uh, it appears that the, the faith that was placed in Barnet uh, during, the devolution, or during the independence debate and then subsequently uh, around the Smith Commission uh, could put us in a position where uh, rather than Barnett act as an, uh, acting as a crutch, it could actually uh, expose us to uh, some considerable variation in funding. Do you see Barnett as being the, the support mechanism that uh, some people place their faith in, or do you see it as a potential elephant trap in this process? It, the, the point that the Barnett wouldn't generally be related to welfare, because welfare welfare in the sense, social security sense, is actually annually managed expenditure. Uh, so, so Barnet isn't, well, isn't relevant for that. What Barnet does do is produce certain constraints on how the Treasury can actually act. Uh, the, those, constraints have operated, those constraints have operated largely, in, largely without any public transparency about them, but they have been, there have been constraints. There are advantages for the Treasury of a system like Barnet because they don't have to have bilateral negotiations about everything to do with, Scot with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. So there is some protection for it. So it speeds up the process after, speeds up the process after, a, after a UK spending review or, or, or a kind of autumn statement. The, the, the kind of Barnet consequences. At the moment, Barnet should, if public spending is going up and relative populations stay the same, Barnet actually leads to some convergence in, in the, in, in the expenditure, per, expenditure per head. The, if, if expenditure is going down in nominal terms, uh, actually Bar Barnet actually leads to the reverse process. So I think that having something like Barnet is an, important, is an important protection. But if the UK government decides the state is going to be a lot smaller, that is certainly going to come through Barnet, yes. But the wealth, the, what people now, the social security type areas that people now tend to call welfare are actually largely done outside Barnet because they're part of annually managed expenditure. So, the, I mean... The way that Barnet has worked has helped um, the Treasury, I think, uh, in the sense of having all of the levers to control the UK macroeconomic policy. So it can control uh, departmental expenditure limits through the um, 
uh, spending review process and annually managed expenditure on a year-to-year -year basis and on that basis it gets an idea of how much it's going to spend what it hasn't done very well in the last seven or eight years is predict how much money it's going to take in and as a result of this, you've got this yawning gap between the amount uh, that the, the UK spends relative to the amount of, uh, of taxes raised. Now, as I said earlier, actually, uh, and although David is right, there, there, is, a, there is implicitly, perhaps, a, um, a process of convergence built into the Barnett formula that ultimately spend per, or, uh, block grant per head would be the same in all parts of the UK. The, the, the rate of convergence has been achingly slow. And decisions about the distribution of spending actually make a difference to the rate of convergence. And I don't think we're going to see much convergence over the next few years because, as I mentioned earlier, the UK government has decided to uh, um, protect health spending, which is a much bigger share of, the, of Scotland's budget than it is of the UK as a whole budget, and also school spending, where the school population in England is rising fast, and it's not the case in Scotland. So Scotland's going to do well on on both of these counts uh, out of Barnet. What it w the the welfare effects uh, will come through the objective of the UK government to balance the budget in 1819 uh, involving cuts both in the Dell budget and also in the uh, annually managed expenditure budget and 12 billion is, going, is, is the amount that they're expecting to take off the welfare bill there and of course the issue with that in a sense is that uh, pensioner benefits are protect, pretty much protected and have been so uh, throughout the last five or six years and therefore the, uh, the, the cuts do tend to fall on working or will tend to fall on, uh, on working age uh, uh, benefits. We spoke earlier about the, uh, the issue of taxation but many of the same arguments could conceivably apply to the issue of welfare. Specifically, um, the Smith Commission proposals contain a, a wide range of options for uh, bringing in additional benefits or top-ups. However, how do you perceive that working in a, a practical sense where if the Scottish uh, Government choose to introduce a, an additional uh, welfare benefit, uh, will that then be used in the assessment for universal credit, for example, and how will that margin uh, be applied in terms of uh, universal credit payments in Scotland once additional benefits are taken into account? I, I think that, I mean, this is something that you clearly need uh, an agreement before you go into any new benefits that Scotland might choose to uh, support. Otherwise, you know, if the, if the UK government is in the position to react against that, then, uh, then uh, um, that uh, becomes self-defeating. You know, it undermines the whole process. And, you know, you, you could imagine a situation maybe where Scotland, with control over some of its benefits, choose to uh, implement the notion of austerity, which is about getting a more uh, uh, long-term sustainable budget by having a, a different balance between tax increases and uh, spending reductions it might be possible to move somewhere along that, uh, th along that kind of path with the powers that, uh, that Smith is, is proposing. But I, I mean, I do think even the existing welfare powers that are being proposed are going to be a huge challenge for, for the Scottish Government. You've got, the, I think, a, an interesting question about whether they should be uh, devolved to the Scottish Government or down to local authority level. You think about what happened with council tax benefit in England, it went down to local authorities and Scotland it, it stayed at the, at the Scottish Government level. And with attendance allowance, really it's local government that's delivering social care policy. So you've got one policy uh, of free personal care in people's homes that is funded by the Scottish Government and then you've got these two benefits, attendance allowance and disability living allowance for, for pensioners which also are actually supporting that objective as well, in a sense. So, 
you know, introducing some coherence around that, you know, ha has potential for big gains, but it, 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 it would be a very complex process to, to think about setting up, and it probably would mean that there would be some losers as well as some gainers uh, out of the process. But I, I think issues like that, you know, charge, uh, contain a, possibly a bigger challenge than some of the tax cuts, the, sorry, tax powers that are, that are being proposed. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's a paragraph in the Smith Report, paragraph 55, which to me seems to suggest that what you, if, if there are top-ups, new benefits, or changes to the areas that are devolved that have financial implications or gains uh, within Scotland, that A, that should be financed, by the Scottish Government, but B, it should not then lead to uh, reductions in benefit entitlement in those areas that are reserved. However, um, that has to be more than a, a commitment in good faith. It has to be more than a goodwill intergovernmental agreement. It has to mean something when somebody goes to the claimant office or submits the claim online and somebody in an office somewhere is trying to process that claim. You know, it has to filter all the way down to that, that, that secretary or whoever uh, administrator who's processing the claim and that's the challenge I think uh, is making it work um, and it's a long-term process. I mean what, what concerns me is a lot of the discussion about welfare devolution is that it's, it assumes that Scotland will spend more um, and if Scotland's going to spend more it's going to have to be at the expense of something else. On a technical level I presume it would be possible for Scotland to spend to, spend, to, to ask the Treasury to ch transfer some of its DEL, say, that uh, comes from health, into, into AMI. So, so basically, technically, you can see how it would happen, but politically, that is not going to be easy at the time one's got such extreme uh, spending pressures and particular problems in health. So that, that it would be possible, to, it'd be possible in, a, in, in a technical sense if the Treasury was amenable to actually get that DEL to AMI transfer, but the question is, what do you spend less on the things which are now within Dell. Yeah. Uh, the word coherence has been used over and over again in relation to the proposals in the Smith Commission paper. Um, I, I would like your opinion on the, the lack of, or whether you believe there is a lack of coherence at top level, for example, between the ability to affect the economy, um, the, the macroeconomic stuff that David Bell mentioned, and then the ability to use that for welfare powers. And I would use as an example um, the work program um, being given the power to help people into jobs, but not being given the power, in my opinion, um, to be able to actually create jobs through a more vibrant economy. I would like your views on the sustainability of that and uh, whether you in fact feel um, if you're willing to say so, that there may perhaps be vital bits missing in this that would allow us to have a more sustainable way of working uh, in the future. Well, uh, I think that's why we should have started with, with that kind of question, because right across the Western world there's this problem about the relationship between job creation, welfare payments, taxation, economic development. Nobody's got it right, uh, but in this country we've certainly got it wrong. Our, our trading policies are not well linked into job creation or welfare. The incentives are, are very odd. Some of the programs are very dysfunctional. And it's important that those programs work together. Now, these programs or the job creation and economic development is not something that largely happens at a UK level. It happens within local labour markets and very localised economies. Uh, and it may well be that some of these things could be more effectively addressed at a Scottish level or at a local level uh, rather than at a UK level. Uh, so we need to step back and think about what is the kind of balance of welfare and taxation powers that will be most effective in getting people into work because there is a political consensus the best way to deal with poverty is to get people into work and get them into well-paid work. Uh, the benefit system can't solve poverty on itself. It's got to link into labor markets. Now, I don't have a blueprint of exactly what power should be located here, but I am absolutely convinced that we've got a very dysfunctional system at, at the moment. Uh, and that if we did have such a system, there is evidence that this could yield economic benefits itself that you could have efficiency enhancing forms of welfare 
rather than passive welfare. All governments have tried to get there, none of them have tried to do it. So that you could use existing welfare spend much more effectively. Uh, and that Scotland might want to do that in a way that is somewhat different from the rest of the United Kingdom. In fact, almost certainly Scotland will want to do it differently from what is happening in the south of England because labour markets are different. And, and, and the way that the economy uh, functions and economic development is, is, is quite different. So we should have started with that question and then asked what are the implications rather than looking at existing welfare benefits and saying which bits can we devolve back to Scotland because that just make, risks making the matter even worse by making it more complex and less coherent. with, uh, with uh, Michael on this point. Scotland has never had more people in work than it has at the moment. You know, there is a real issue around the quality of, of, uh, of, uh, of a lot of the jobs. Uh, there, there's a real issue, it seems to me, around real living standards because wages have not been increasing uh, as fast as prices have been increasing over the last five or six uh, years. Uh, it, you know, there are many labour markets that are operating a lot worse than, than the Scottish labour market is uh, at the minute. One point, though, that I would make is that in relation to the powers that, that uh, are, are proposed um, is that it seems to me that the ability to influence the life chances of people at the, the bottom end of the income distribution, those people who are in work but would like to work more hours, are, are being, you know, their hourly pay is not as high as it, uh, as it, uh, as it might be. Um, the Smith Commission doesn't deliver a whole lot of powers, so the income tax powers are possibly not very relevant to a lot, a lot of these people. The welfare powers are, are, are the, in, in terms of the spend, is m mostly focused on older people. One of the uh, uh, things that I um, was a little puzzled about was that there was no mention even of a discussion about the possibility of, of affecting the minimum wage or have, uh, having, some, having some control over that in Scotland, which didn't seem to me necessarily uh, to, to carry a great economic risk. Uh, uh, and, and might have had more effect uh, there. But the, the labour market is doing uh, not too badly. The real problem, which is a problem not just of the UK, but of the US and indeed most of Europe, is getting productivity up. Cool. Yeah, I, I don't agree with anything, disagree with anything David has said. <laughs> I, I, the labour market is not generating high paid jobs. That was my point. It's generating low-paid part-time jobs. So I think we're in Professors agree with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola. A point about the coherence issue, um, and that's the relationship between the work programme and Job Centre Plus. Um, I know that some of the proposals of the parties to the Smith Commission had envisaged a role for the Scottish Government in uh, Job Centre Plus. I think Liberal Democrats wanted to have it, um, and that hasn't materialised in the recommendations. Um, I think that disjuncture is going to be problematic um, as the work programme moves north, um, which will come with a substantial cut, uh, I'm sure of that, um, but also just the issues around conditionality, um, I, I, I suspect that will keep many people awake at night <laughs> when they have to try and, try and merge these things together. Uh, Mark? Thank, thanks, Camino. I think you know, we've touched on the point there, which is obviously one of the ways that you can reduce welfare spend is to improve the quality of work and the quality of pay, which allows for a reduction in in-work benefits. The, the question I would pose, though, is um, obviously the Smith Commission talks about the ability to top up. It talks about the ability to create new benefits. But there is, a, there is an absolute link, obviously, between tax and welfare in terms of how you fund things. And do you have concerns that, given that, for example, the, well, the, the, the substantial tax that we will have control of will be income tax, that there isn't that flexibility of approach available to perhaps provide that funding for additional uh, benefits and top-ups? So it might be that these become, in the way that you were speaking about earlier, in terms of the atrophying of some of the initial tax powers that came when the Parliament was first established, they become powers that we have but we lack the flexibility of approach to be able to actually use them in a meaningful way. So, uh, I mean, uh, our, 
work suggests that um, you, it depends how people react and, and the 42,000 people who, who are responsible for a large chunk of the income tax are, are crucial in this but one pence increase in, in, the, in the income tax rate is going to raise maybe 300 million pounds. The welfare budget in Scotland is about 16, 17 billion pounds. So you know, you're only going to, you're only going to uh, affect things very much at, uh, at the margin unless you're uh, prepared to have very substantial or make very substantial use of the income tax power in which case you may you know, you're going to run into risks with having a, a large neighbor uh, next door where income tax rates are lower uh, and uh, and uh, y you might end up uh, actually ha that having a negative effect on on the potential revenue Lewis? Yeah, just uh, on, in terms of that coherence, clearly one of the principles underlying the Smith Commission, accepted by the Smith Commission at the outset, was that there should continue to be a coherence across the UK as well in terms of the pooling and sharing of resources and providing um, comparable uh, benefits to people in similar circumstances in different parts of the UK. Do you believe that the Smith proposals achieve that coherence in a way that still allows uh, the Scottish Government, Scottish Parliament to take initiatives that address particular issues specific to Scotland, both in the area of welfare and support and also in the area of job creation. Five of them are stumped. Not especially. I mean, I, I don't think it started from that. I, I think that was a statement rather than a guiding principle in a sense so you know if you if if you go back to what Michael was saying about starting with these broader issues if that's the objective then move from there and then think about you know the whole picture and the whole distribution of powers there but I don't really I think it's just been much more piecemeal than that and pragmatic in a way about political compromise rather than that bigger picture yeah, and I, I think it's, it's a critical question and this came up during the referendum a lot when the Labour Party saying, well, this is a, a sharing union, which, which is a coherent concept. We understand what that means. But then what are the practical implications? So what should be shared? Uh, should we have the same health service? We don't. Should we have the same unemployment benefits? Maybe that's a stronger case. Should we share pensions? That raises uh, other kinds of considerations. So yes, we need to have diversity. We need to have some common uh, social entitlements that seems to be a widely shared view but translating that into particular services that's where the difficulty arises and how much variation would be reasonable you know you do have some benefits that are contributory so I mean there certainly is a case that if you've made the same amount of contribution you should get the the same reward whether you're in Scotland England or in Spain as many are I think I think that is an important point I think the, well, in terms of the welfare area, the test I would apply is that can Scotland manage it better? Now, there'll be certainly areas like the interface where the interface between housing benefit and housing benefit and provision of council houses and housing association houses are where UK policy has gone, gone haywire. So where you think in the long term you can actually do things better, there are obvious gains, but there might be a short-term hit but there might be a long-term gain. I think the, the, thing, the, the issue w which would disturb me most is that there's the question of um, political attitudes in Scotland seem somewhat different to those in England on average. And the question about how, if, if, the, if the UK is going to move to a much smaller state with much less provision of public services, provision of public services out of taxes, the extent to which Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland can be different from that uh, because of the relative populations. I mean, the, the kind of, m one, of the, one of my favourite statistics is that I I if you thought of the UK as a federation, as becoming federation, there's no, Ontario is 35% of the population of Canada, England's 84% of the population of the United Kingdom, and that's a, a really a quite a fundamental problem. One of the great difficulties 
is this is tending to get formulated in the Scotland versus England question, whereas I'm deeply worried about what's actually happening to the north of, it, north of England and the Midlands, and where, where the concentration of economic activity and high-paid jobs and migration of labour, of skilled labour, from the rest of England into the southeast. I think that England has got a massive problem, which has not been, recon not been recognised. Charlie, and Rob and uh, Linda will need to go in a minute to go to questions, but we'll carry on just for a few moments. But, so, Charlie, on you go. I, I just wanted to re report some, some, some evidence from a survey we did of public attitudes while the Smith Commission was sitting, which throws some light onto this discussion um, and uh, reveals the Scots as somewhat paradoxical. Um, uh, over 60% of Scots want welfare devolution, whatever they mean by name over 60 percent, so a clear majority, and we've seen that in surveys for a, a decade or more. Uh, 51 percent at least want the same uh, level of benefits as in the rest of the UK. Uh, and in terms of, of old age pensions, for example, 55 percent think that they should be paid for by the UK taxpayer. Other welfare benefits, 48 percent think they should be paid for by the UK-wide taxpayer and only 31% by the Scottish taxpayer. So there's something rather strange there about wanting the power, not necessarily wanting to do anything different with it, and having a, a significant level of contribution of the UK-wide taxpayer to finance uh, the benefits. I'll leave you to puzzle out how you reconcile all that. <laughs> Drew, I think Drew had a quick, quick question. Um, uh, but I, mean, it's, I think that's, that's very interesting to, to unpack what people actually mean when they say that they, they support more powers um, for the Scottish Parliament. I think that is at the heart of the rest of this. But just go back to that um, the, the around um, uh, welfare. And I think David said that there seems to be an attitude in Scotland um, that, if you like, is more sympathetic to welfare. I just wondered if anyone had any actual ac academic evidence that attitudes to uh, uh, welfare in Scotland are significantly different. I mean, the only evidence I'm aware of is, is Professor Curtis's evidence, which says they're broadly the same. I, wasn't, I didn't actually use the term welfare. I mean, I, I said the size of the state, which would cover health and education. We, we did a survey actually on, uh, and asked a question about the benefit cap, and uh, Scots were slightly more uh, uh, willing to see a higher cap, but it, w it wasn't a huge difference. In, in public attitudes research, the Scots appear to be a little, left wing, little more left-wing on most of these kinds of measures, but not by very much. The big difference between uh, Scotland and England uh, is that the Conservative Party is rather weaker uh, here, uh, and therefore you get a different dynamic of political debate, which is not structured in, in the more straightforwardly left-right uh, pattern that, that applies um, in, the, in the House of Commons, which is dominated by uh, MPs from England. Uh, Humour me, convener, thank you. Um, I mean, I suppose that goes to, I, I mean, in a sense, I, I, mean, I would say it's quite easy to be radical about, um, about a political debate around some of these things if you don't have any power or responsibility. Um, to actually deal with it, um, you know, that's a very easy form of radicalism. And I, I suppose um, Lord Smith himself said uh, to the committee when, when uh, he was here that he felt there was a need um, for both governments to be clearer about what they actually do. Um, I wondered if there was any examples internationally of, of you know, how do um, if you, like sub-central um, levels of government that work more effectively than, than our own, do we see that, that same tendency to... Um, spend time talking about the issues that you don't control. Yes, and, and, and you also get the same paradox that Charlie has uh, mentioned. In fact, there's comparative research some by Charlie himself and some uh, from elsewhere. Well, federalism or devolution paradox that people want to control the services, but they want the levels to be the same uh, uh, as elsewhere. I don't think it's necessarily uh, as paradoxical uh, as that because you could legitimately say we'd like to control the services but we don't want to lose out on any particular so that's the way you put the question but if you say should we be allowed to spend less on roads and more on schools say put it that way you might get a different kind of answer but in any case public policies don't come from a public opinion polls they come from social compromises amongst social groups and I think it's quite clear that in Scotland the social compromise is a bit different 
from what it is in the south of England, because there's evidence that the north of England is a little bit like Scotland. And that is why consistently the Scottish Parliament, under both administrations, the coalition and the SNP administration, have gone for more universalism, less selectivity, which is not necessarily more redistributive, but it's a different way of defining the public domain. That, that there should be a, a, a sharing, that all people should share the same kind of public services. There's less support for private education. We did surveys amongst professionals a, a while ago, at least there were surveys done, showing there's less support among, in the medical profession here for marketization. Uh, there's less support in, amongst the teaching profession to move away from comprehensive education. So at all levels of society, there's a commitment to something that looks a little bit more like the Nordic countries, where everybody pays in and everybody gets the same services, which is more egalitarian, but not necessarily redistributive. Uh, and th that, I think, is where Scotland would probably go, and that's where we see these divergences in, in public policy, which have then got to have the fiscal space to, to, to realize them. Without differences in taxation powers, you can't actually realize that, in, except in very marginal ways. I think we're preventing this to close, I'm afraid. Um, thank you very much. But can I just one question, try something novel, try and get a yes and no answer from <laughs> five professors. 2016, we, if this legislation is passed uh, successfully, do you think we need to come back here again and do some more of this? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for your considered contributions this morning. We've all found it very valuable, and thank you. No doubt we will be back again with some of you at some stage. Um, next meeting, next Thursday, and we'll have the Electoral Management Board focusing on the electoral administration of the referendum. Thank you very much, everybody. That's the conclusion of the meeting. Thank you.